Put that phone down. Get me the radio tower. Put it down. Major Strasser has been shot. Round up the usual suspects. Come on, come on. Round up the usual suspects, one of the most quoted lines in the history of motion pictures. Most people believe that Claude Rains thought it up, but it was written for him by two young screenwriters at Warner Brothers, Julius and Philip Epstein, twin brothers, twin talents, over half a century ago. This twin is Julius. Philip Epstein is no longer with us. But Julie lives and works in this home in the high rent district above Bel Air complete with the obligatory Beverly Hills swimming pool. He got here by writing not only Casablanca, but so many other hits in the last 60 years, they ought to embarrass him. But they don't. I'm Walter Matthau, and I saw Casablanca when it first opened in 1942, which proves there are a lot of good things about being my age. And I wish I could remember what they were. This is a photograph of the boxing team he was on at Penn State. He became the Bantamweight champion. He's in the center of the front row and was known as Battling Julie Epstein. He later went several bruising rounds with Jack Warner. And here is Julie in a quieter moment as painted by his wife, Anne. I was lucky enough to star in two of Julie's epics, Pete and Tilly with Geraldine Page and Carol Burnett and House Calls, written by Julie and Max Schulman. He won his first Academy Award nomination for Four Daughters in 1938, no doubt during his childhood, and his most recent for Reuben Rubin in 1983, 45 years later after he grew up. And this is a photograph of Julie and Anne together. This is another of Anne's paintings of Julie, her favorite model, because he worked cheap. He has been disgustingly successful, one of the most brilliant and versatile writers in Hollywood history in both comedy and drama. Julie, I think it's been said before, but here's looking at you, kid. In uh, the beginning of my junior year at Penn State, for the first time, they instituted a playwriting course. And I was a history and political science major. And I took the course. And uh, I found out that, you know, I could write several. There was a, three one-act plays, and I wrote those, and they received. Now, the next semester, they continued the course, but I was the only one allowed to continue on. But I sat with the, I, they, had, they were 101, I was 102. And I sat with them and took the class, but I was a class by myself. He was supposed to write a three-act play, which I wrote. Then when I was Graduates, graduated from Penn State, noticed the correct grab. I didn't say graduate, I said graduated from Penn State. It was, uh, you might say, the height of the Depression. And in the summer of 1931, I had a brief career, brief, very brief career, three fights as a professional fighter. How did you do with three fights? Hmm? The three fights, how did you do? Two wins and a draw. And I said, what a great opportunity to retire undefeated. <laughs> Lightweight or lower, actually? And, 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 uh, I, in college, I was a band of weight and featherweight, mostly at the pros, just featherweight. Okay. My fraternity brother played a big part in my life. He was married to an orchestra leader, big orchestra leader. And he hired, they hired me at... Uh, $15 a week to be the office boy to sweep up and also do all the publicity for the, for the uh, orchestra writer. And uh, then uh, my fir first entry of the show business was there was a, a musical act called The Funny Bonus, three people. 
and I think sax, uh, bass or something, and they get a booking on the Rudy Valley Variety Show, which was the big show at the period, and they asked me to write a sketch for them, and my brother and I wrote a sketch for their appearance on the Rudy Valley Show, and the quality of the sketch could be far in, in the first two lines. It was the Roman Forum, said, and the two senators, two senators meet and said, uh, any news of import? No, export? That gives you an idea of the quality of the show. Anyhow, it went on, the sketch went on, and half of Brooklyn was in our living room listening to the radio that night, and the sketch goes on, any news of import, export, not a single laugh, not, an entire ten minutes, in, not a single laugh, nothing, absolutely. And the next day, the funny boaters came in the office. He said, what happened? He said, here's what happened. You know, they have a studio audience. And then when they do the commercials, they lower a glass curtain. So they lowered the glass curtain for the commercial, and then they forgot to raise the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my entry with the show. But so we got $40 between us. And then... It's too complicated to go into too much detail, but there was a, uh, the Park Central Hotel had a, a nightclub called Copeland Grove, fashioned after the Copeland Grove. Incidentally, my uncle was the architect of the hotel. And they had a one floor show after them. They were all terrible flops, terrible flops. Then my fraternity brother and Jerry Wald took the show over. And they had this old star show. Remember, Russ Columbo was the big orchestra leader, lots of other acts. And the master of ceremonies was Fatty Yarbuckle, released from prison. And I never went to prison, I don't think, but he, he was acquitted, but he was a disgrace. And our job was, he was the MC. We would sit at a table with Arbuckle, and when the celebrity came in, we used to give him a joke to introduce the celebrity. <laughs> the show lasted one week. When they announced that Fatty Arbuckle was going to be the MC, all the women's organization threatened to boycott all the advertisers. Three weeks later, Arbuckle was dead. The show was over. And my fraternity brother and Vaughn flew to California to tell the idea of the happenings, as a, and they sold that idea to Warner Brothers. And I'm sitting in Brooklyn, everybody sat in Brooklyn, and I said, I know Paul, but certainly he can't write a line. I know Jerry Wald can't write a line. What's happening out there? Then I got a telegram, which I think I can quote verbatim, that said, Offer you a job as our secretary, $25 a week, room and board, hop a bus. <laughs> well, I didn't, my folks gave me the money for, a, for an excursion train. And I landed October 14th, 1933. I landed at the Third Street Station at 10.30 at night. At midnight, I was writing a scene they had to hand in Monday. Literally writing at 12 o'clock at night. That, that was Friday night. Sunday, they took me to the Paramount Theater, the movie theater. And the picture was uh, Connor Juma with Bing Crosby and Mary Carlyle. And they said to me, that's a close-up. <laughs> that's a fade-out. <laughs> <That's laughs> they gave me a four-year, what was later would be a four-year, college, film school education, in one afternoon. Well, I, mean, I, I kept writing that story. What would happen, they had a bungalow close to Warner Brothers. When they had a story conference, they would say, we can't think unless we can pace. So they went out, got into the car, drove at 60 miles an hour to the bungalow, they would say about the pie, I would tell them what to say, but they would go back and get back into the coffee conference. The picture came out, it was called 20 Million Sweethearts. Dick Powell. We got out and it was looked good. 
So Paramount offered a job for Paul to do the big broadcast of something, or thing for or something. And I wrote the screenplay, he was playing golf. Those days, you didn't have to write a full script, but you wrote 15 pages of story idea. I wrote an a, a original story every night. And finally, one sold. Jerry took it to the studio. When it came back on the cover, it said, by Jerry Walden. <laughs> and that's how I got started. I, the Warner Brothers offered me $100 a week for four weeks. And... After four weeks, they could fire me, and uh, the story belonged to them. After the first batch of pages, they signed me. Seven, I was there a cumulative 17 years at Warner Brothers, and that's how I got started. If anybody's interested. How long did it take before you finally did sell that one? About six to eight months. So we're talking maybe a couple of hundred... Well, I'm exaggerating there. You know, I would start one every night. <laughs> how long? How long did it take you to finish one? Well, some would be one night. It would be ten or fifteen pages, and uh, uh, no dialogue or anything like that. And that was the usual course. So they would buy ten or fifteen page stories. Uh, I, I was, I was amused. Uh, I think it was last week to read in the L.A. Times a story about a, a very good screenwriter today. Uh, and, they, and they remarked how wonderful it was that he has done seven pictures in six years. Now, I have there on, on my desk a New York Times film directory which for 1935 lists five pictures, released pictures, but that's not the whole story. Last year, I lectured at the New York School, New School for Research in New York, and they had a bio, and there were seven pictures of mine in 1935. The other were two, other two were so bad that not only had I forgotten about them, but the New York Times had forgotten about them. That was seven pictures in one year. And the five pictures, you can, you can see them, they were all terrible, but there were five of them in 19th listed in actually seven pictures. And here a big fuss was being about because I read I'd done seven pictures in six years. Now we look at those days, we look back at the 30s as, as yeah. the golden age of Hollywood. We didn't think so at the time. We didn't think it was golden at all. Maybe a little bronze here and there, but far from gold. I was just, just, just going <laughs> to ask you how gold was it. Yeah, obviously not great. Um, no, but how did you get started with film? What happened was that... Um, uh, Fred and I wrote a play. The theater could put on the play, and we're back. And then I told Jerry, I'm not going to, after about seven pictures, to suppose I'm not going to work with it. You know, I'm going to go with it myself. And I started, and Phil was then, he got his job. He was at a dinner party, and there was a director called Lee Jason. And Phil was very funny at the dinner party. So the, Lee said to him, you come on the set, I'll pay you $100 out of my own pocket. If I need a line, you can give it to me. And that's how Phil got started with Warner Brothers. When I was settled at Warner's, I said to Jack Warner, I'd like to work with my brother. He said, sure. Phil came over, and that's how it started. It was interesting in those times. Just, just before the picture was to come out, I got a call from... Jack Warner. He says, I'm not putting any pressure on you. I really am not. He says, but your name is going to be on the screen for the first time and hopefully for many, many pictures. Would you like to change your name now? <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. Well, why would he want you to change your name? Because it was the Hitlerian days and they didn't want too many Jewish names on the screen. What was Jack Warner's real name? I <laughs> nobody ever knows. <laughs> when you first started writing those stories, those fifteen-page stories every night, where did you get the ideas? From well, the they, they they came from anywhere, and, and, and I, I can tell you how I got the story that got me into the business of living on velvet is by reading Time magazine. There was a story 
of a man who committed suicide by flying his plane over the ocean until the he ran out of gas. That was set me off on and that and when I got through with the picture, that wasn't in the picture at all. <laughs> but it set me off. And, and the play, uh, first play, which was uh, with the theater guild called "And Stars Remain," also came from Time Magazine. It was the release of Madame Stavisky and the big French scandal from jail, and that also that, that's that, that's how those ideas came. They came from reading from things that actually happened or even knew happened to people from stealing from every place. The thing about the old days was if you were a one type picture writer, you were not on the contract. You could not last on the contract. Uh, you had you had to you had to be versatile. And your versatility the you know, the quality of the versatility varied throughout the pictures, but you had to be versatile. Uh, you had to do a musical, and you had to do heavy drama. Uh, and and the pictures were assigned, not who was good for things, but, but who was available at the moment among the 75 or 100 writers that you had at the studio. I, I, if I ever wrote a book, which I probably won't do, uh, about the uh, old days, I would call it the writer's table. The writer's table, which doesn't exist anymore, because no writers on the contract, was a delight. We would... Only come in in time for the writer's table, which gives rise to some more stories about my brother and the, about our relationship to Jack Warner. Uh, we would come in, in just in time for the writer's table, because that was a lot of fun. And that was about 12.30, 1 o'clock. And we were supposed to come in at 9 o'clock. And one day, coming through the door, we ran into Jack Warner, and he was in a very bad mood. He said, God damn it. He said, railroad presidents come in at 9 o'clock, bank presidents come in at 9 o'clock, and you're coming in at 9 o'clock. So we went to our office, if you were halfway through a script, we sent it up to Jack Warner and said, DJL, have the bank president finish the script. Uh, we got away with it because... We didn't care if we were fired. We knew we were of the studio took a job, but he he didn't say a word. A couple of weeks later, we came in even later, and he he was even madder. And he said, this does it. Read your contract. You're coming in at night. Talk to your lawyers. You're coming in at nine o'clock or else. So we were back and wrote a terrible scene. And we set it up to Warner, and he sent for us. He said, this is the worst scene I've ever read in my life. It's terrible. And my brother Phil said, how is that possible? It was written at 9 o'clock. And Warner said, I want my money back. My brother said, I would love to give you your money back, but I've just built a swimming pool with it. However, if you're ever in the neighborhood and feel like a swim, feel, please feel free to come and use the pool. And we still couldn't get fired. So, so t tell me what the writer's table was about. And well, the writer's table was a light. It was full of corny, unsophisticated belly laughs. We would use we would use the public address system freely. We would say Betty Davis, Betty Davis, and she would walk to her phone, and then we would say, "Where did you get that hat?" <laughs> I would say. John Garfield, John Garfield, would come and say, your Wasserman test has arrived. <laughs> and everybody, directors, producers, wanted to be invited to write a stand. And we were very, our standards were very high. The only one we had allowed to come to the table regularly was Errol Flynn. Because Errol Flynn would regale us with his previous night's activities in detail. So we always welcomed Errol Flynn. We never invited Ronald Reagan to our table. Did Jack Warner really bar you from the previews? He barred us from the preview. And the only and all the pre previews were rather than Pasadena at the time. But the producer, Henry Blanky, told us what theater it was. So Phil and I went to the uh, prop department and we got two hillbilly 
beards with the rubber bands, with rubber bands all, all the rat eat beards. And he drove up to the theater, and they, you know, they stay in front of the theater until the picture's over, until they can go into the pew. They were all standing in front of the box office, and we went up and said, two tickets, please. <laughs> and we went up and saw our picture. Then we had the cards, if you remember, preview cards, how did you like it, what you, and we made our cards in Yiddish. <laughs> I tell you, those we didn't think so in those days, but now looking back on them, they were a lot of fun. Making pictures then was a lot of fun. It was a smaller town, it was a smaller town. Well, every studio was a family, and uh, a lot of people had their whole career at one studio of all the years, 20 years more than that. You were there, so tell us, how did the Screenwriters Guild get started? Well. It gets, uh, it gets uh, first of all, uh, the guilds got started when the studios tried to put in a 50% pay cut because of the Depression. And the Writers Guild, I think one of the reasons, well, that was, of course, a big reason, financial reason, but one of the big reasons was that the producers decided the credits on the picture. And many a brother-in-law <laughs> had his name on the screen who had nothing to do with pictures. It turns out it was one of the big reasons. And then, of course, they broke, they broke the guild. They, they started an organization called the Screen Playwrights. And one of the top names were in the Screen Playwrights. And they really broke the guild. Until a couple of years later, the Wagner Labor Relations Act was passed. And they had to have an election for the guild. And they had a trial. By the labor had a trial, and I was one of the witnesses. The trial would say to him, how did they coerce you? How did they try to get you to vote against, not to join the guild, but vote against the guild? I knew I was going to be called. I had a hundred zingers prepared. They had the biggest lawyer in California, Neil McCarthy, and he was doing the cross-examination. I had 70 zingers prepared to wow them. I get on the trial. He said, what, you know what he asked? I said, Walter McCune called me in his office and said, you want to join the guild. He said, the witness is excused. <laughs> and I was left with 70 singers. But we won the election and the guild, that's how the guild got started. Well, I'm sure it wasn't easy. Even though it was a family of Warner Brothers, did Jack Warner fight against the union? Was it? Did Jack Warner fight against the union? Oh, of course, they all did. Oh, they fought bitterly against the union. Well, how was it collaborating with Phil? Was it difficult working with your brother? Uh, I, 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 it was not really a collaboration because we were twins. I would start a sentence, he would finish it, he, the other way around. It was not really a collaboration. After he died, I found out I really couldn't know. I tried three times with Billy Wilder to that baby. We never reached the word on paper. Uh, I just couldn't do it. I did have a very g nice collaboration with uh, with Max Schulman just you know once, and that's how we were we we were very much alike Max Schulman and I. But we never sat down to give line by line. He would go to a room and write the scene. I would write the scene. Then we would get together and say, "Well, use this from that." And we never had an argument or anything, and it worked out very well. But I I I, I can't collaborate. Because I, I think of so many terrible things that I'm ashamed to say it even to myself. <laughs> Wrote some, some solo scripts, too. Oh, yes. But uh, tougher than collaborating. After Phil died. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, was it tougher to write alone than it was in collaboration? Uh, it was tougher to do without Phil, yeah. Still is. And uh, I avoid collaboration now, and I just can't do it. And there are some people who can only collaborate, like George Kaufman. And damn good, even with the collaboration. What's the difference between adapting for plays and adapting for novels? The difficulty in the stage play, there were usually one set plays, and which is very difficult. And the asset was that lots of times there was a lot of good dialogue you can use. In a novel, you would find that there were scenes 
that have to be written fully that the novelist maybe used three dots for. And you had to you had to flesh out those scenes fully dialogue. And uh, while you had much more material usually to work from from a novel than there was in a play, uh, now I found plays easier to work from than novels. How did you actually go about uh, breaking down a book? Well, th there, the, that's, that's where you use the step outline comes into play. You would say, well, what is there that I could use, or what do I have to make up, or, or originate to to keep the thing going? And you took what you could use and put in a lot of stuff later that you never used because it was three or four hundred page novel or something like that. But uh, you you have to decide what was usable and what wasn't usable and you put it in your step outline. And now in a play, usually your step outline was there for you. Well, how do you develop a scene? Well, I, when you say that, uh, every scene uh, uh, every scene needs is a different strategy. A comedy, a dramatic scene needs a different strategy than a comedy scene or uh, a scene that uh, truly description. I had no set method of working that way. And I take each scene as it came. What are the what is the essential to a comedy scene, though? Well, comedy is to, it has to be funny. I uh, said, so I would I would go to Jack Warren and say, hey, look, I saw something buy it for us. And he would buy it for us. It was a, can you imagine doing that today to go into a studio, say, buying something from me? First of all, I could never get into the studio today. And uh, it's kind of, I, I, I must confess to uh, a certain method of operation. I don't keep, the only notes I keep is dialogue. That can be used. And I'll give you an example of how a one line of dialogue turns out to be a whole scene in the picture. This is dialogue over with some woman I know gave birth to a boy, and she said, oh, he's amazing, he's 21 inches long and weighs 12 pounds and everything. And I said, listen, I said, you only get out of something what you put into it. And I put it down for a dialogue. And then when we, I did uh, what we did doing the house calls, I said, how could I use that line? Well, she's going to have a baby. So a whole hospital scene came into being to get that one line in. And I've done that quite often. It, it's, it's kind of a dishonest way of doing it, but <laughs> I found it very useful to do that. Why did you adapt so many plays and books instead of writing uh, original stories? Very early, very early. First of all, when you're under contract or studio, you, if you were to read a story, you belonged to them. So you, that stopped you from doing it. But the real reason is that when I read my first the one that sold, Living on Velvet, and then I found out what happens when you go to work at a studio, all the input and all the chain, you know, the directors and the actors and the producers, and this is your baby, and you had, I used to, you have to sit there and take it, especially when I was there on $100 a week for four weeks, and it's not your baby anymore. It's much less painful when they give you an assignment and they do that. It's not your baby. You want to lose to your baby? Okay, it's all right with me. But to do it, that's why I wouldn't dream of writing an original for a studio. In those days, too, Broadway was the source of a lot of movies, but today, only a few get made from plays. Why is that? Uh, because the, uh, a, new, the, the new type of playwriting is where the actor speaks to the audience. <laughs> and uh, they, they don't write the well-made three-act play is dead forever. They don't do that anymore, with the exception of Neil Simon. And his plays always are made into movies. And uh, just not movie material anymore. What is a well-made three-act play? Well, then I have to quote George Abbott, who's now 107, 108 years old. This quote was made when he was, in his youth, when he was 90-something. He said, in the first act, you get your leading man, a woman, up in a tree. Second act, you throw rocks at him. 
And the third actually get him out of the tree and down to safely. And so Julie Epstein became an expert at getting his leading actors up in a tree and then getting them out. But it was the rocks he threw at them that made it interesting. The way I work, I work longhand on a legal, yellow legal pad. I never read what I have written. Most writers read the morning what they've written the day before. Make a, I never read it until I have a complete first draft. Then when I go back, I really, I'm surprised at how good some of it and how bad some of it is. And then right often I've used the same dialogue <laughs> in different situations and forgotten about that. But it then it becomes so obvious to me its faults and its virtues. And that's why I never read what I've written while I work on a script. And then I have a rule that every scene must pull its weight. There must be. Some scenes are just exposition. You have to have them. That's it. There's got to be something in that scene to justify it being in the... It's some entertaining value. Sometimes it's a line of dialogue. Sometimes it's a piece of business. It's a, you don't always succeed in doing that, but that's my aim. So that every scene has its value, no matter if it's just a scene of exposition. How much do you think the actors add to what you write? Well, I, 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 there are two terrible things picture make. Both start with the letter I. One is input, and the other is improvisation. And uh, I think that the great evil of the business is, is improvisation. And uh, uh, you sit there, you write dialogue, and, and you sort of become like a dialogue specialist, but they think they can write better dialogue. Than they can, it's, I think it's one of the bane of the industry. It's, and it takes a strong director to keep the actors from doing it. And I've worked with strong directors and I've worked with weak directors. Did you ever want to direct yourself? I, <laughs> I did one test with Bill Holden at Paramount. I was so state when I got in front, I, I, I couldn't talk. I was so stage struck. You know, I was, uh, I mean, and the distance from the sound stage to the head of the studio was four, was actually 440 yards, a quarter of a mile. He broke the world record for a 440 yard run, running from the stage as he got rid of this bum. I looked at the picture. <laughs> Later on, I directed tests, and that was gone. But uh, I thought when I, that, that I was really so terrified that I kept stuttering to the actors. And I didn't blame him for what he did at all. I think if you're a storyteller, you never think of that. I think it comes naturally, it's part of you. I never say structure, I never think of structure. You gotta have this at, uh, at this point. I, uh, I was in a f film school back east, and I saw the notes on the table. He said, first 10 pages you do this, second page you do that. And which, which maybe it works for these people, but I, I always found it. I thought if you're a storyteller, the structure is there. It's, it comes naturally. It's as natural as breathing. Do you write a treatment, Julie? Do you write a treatment? In, in, in the old days, some, some producers would demand a treatment, but I, after a while, I got a little power. I refused to do treatments. What do your first drafts look like? I mean, are, are They're long. They're very long. Very long. And because I've never read it from day to day, the obvious cuts, when you look at it again, the cuts are obvious. And only to, I don't think you can tell, you can cut Tuesday what you wrote Monday. It has to be Tuesday six months later. And that's the way, anyhow, it, I work. Are you a fast writer? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, my usual uh, first draft is eight, ten weeks. Three months of tops or something. I don't know if that's fair or not. Let's talk. Let's talk about characters. I feel I'm, I'm all the characters. <laughs> of all the 
gin joints in all the towns in all the world. She walks into mine. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. Oh, I can't remember it myself. I'm a little rusty. I'll hum it for you. Da 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 da. Obviously, Casablanca is one of your favorites. How about Light in a Piazza? That's one of my favorites, yeah. That's a solo? Yeah. Can you tell us how that came about? Wasn't that a, wasn't that a story or a... Uh, oh, yes. It was a, it was a long, it was a long, short story in the New York. And, uh, it was just a light. It was really a mature story, and uh, it's one of my favorites. It's uh, didn't do well at the box office, I don't think. What was the story? Uh, the story is of a woman who passes her. She has a retarded daughter, and she passed. She there in Italy, and Italy don't know the difference between. <laughs> Usually their prime ministers are the retarded ones. <laughs> and she passes her off, and she winds up marrying George Hamilton in the picture. And the last line, did I do the right thing or didn't I, you know? I thought it was a wonderful story. It was a delight working on it. And, uh... How about the brothers, brothers Karamazov? Well, that's... One of the things I still get furious about. I think we wrote a very, they thought the script was wonderful. I think it's one of the best things, that Phil and I did, one of the best things we ever did. And then they called us in. Remember we had, the lovers had name, the mother of one of the women screenwriters, the story. She, she would tell the story to the executives. Forget her name. And I didn't know anything about it. And they, they were all the executives. And she started to tell the story. As if you would tell a story to the kindergarten class. And she said, then the bells would ring. And they would come in in their flowing robes. And they would sit down. And I figured that, you know, she's telling it. She thinks these people are idiots. So I gave her a big wink. You know, I know what you're doing. And she was furious. And then she had a great deal of power. And she said, look, these boys are not serious about this assignment. So they turned it over to uh, Richard Brooks, something, and And uh, Did you get the credit on Karamazov? Yeah, we got a story credit on this, but it was uh, one of our great sorrows and disappointments. But I wish you could be there to hear the way she told the story to the executive. Sam Katz fell fast asleep. And then somebody reads it beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Why was that one in particular such a disappointment? Because I thought we had written, we loved this, naturally loved, thought we had done a very good script. Then it was, I thought, ruined. Why are studio executives really have the power to set the course of a screenplay to decide what has to be written, what they like, what they don't like? The truth of the matter is that in... 60 years in this business, I've perhaps met two producers that I have any respect for. Or, and uh, in the old days of nepotism, they were brother-in-laws, they were nephews. Today, they all have college degrees. And as much as we laughed at the producers and made fun of them and ridiculed them in the old days. Let me, uh, I think it was starting to happen. In 1973, I got a call from Boston University and said, we're doing a five-day symposium on the transition from silent to sound. 
wouldn't come. I said, I was not here in the Saturday. I didn't miss it by much. They said, come anyhow. Strangely enough, it was held not in Boston, but in Rochester at the Eastman Kodak buildings. There were two representatives from every branch. Walter Reich and I represented screenwriters. Frank Capra, Ruben Vermillion represented directors. Gene Arthur was one of them, and so on down the list. And for five nights, we sat around a round table at the bar till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning talking about what was then known as the old days. And the big up because what did these ignorant, illiterate immigrants have that created a great business? We know they said ridiculous things. I mean, Harry Cohn used the word which I think should be in the English language and all the big stories. He said his story, story was too sorbid. Well, I think it's a wonderful word. You know exactly what he meant, you see. And here were all the Capra, the Mooney, and Arthur. I mean, nobody could pinpoint what these people had. He said, we're big gamblers. We're big gamblers today, too. If you go put $60, $70 million in the picture, you're gambling. What are these? Nobody had the answer. Except that they, they love making movies. And as uh, really we may say, I don't care what it costs. Get me the best in every department. But uh, it, it was a mystery then. It is still a mystery as to what. Because these people were really ignorant. I mean, uh, my brother worked for Sam Brisket, and he had a line, I think it was, won't you sit down, Father? And this is said, no, 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 no. It, it should be, Father, won't you sit down? Let him know immediately what the relationship is. <laughs> this is what we were dealing with. And yet, this great industry, and wonderful pictures came out of that era, despite the fact that we had this terrible censorship. Red! 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 You go! Where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Remember the shockwave that went through the nation when Clark Gable said, I, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And gone with the wind. And he, he said, did you hear that? He said, damn. <laughs> and if you had hell, you couldn't say hell in the movie. Brother and I got a picture called uh, My Foolish Heart for Sam Goldman from the uh, Salinger story in a New Yorker. And it was based on a divorce. We finished the picture, <laughs> and the Bruno officer says, you cannot have a divorce. It was very heavy Catholic. We cannot allow a divorce in the picture. We said, well, we have no strain. No. We can't have a divorce. They said, no, you can't do it. Well, we yelled, and to his credit, Goldwyn yelled, and he yelled much better than we yelled, <laughs> and louder than we yelled. They said, I, they said, I'll tell you what we'll allow you to do. If you prove, if you show that Susan Hayward is punished by the divine powers because she had a divorce. Well, uh, why don't you have her come out of a courtroom and get hit by a truck and killed? Then we'll allow it. It's absolutely true. Well, so we had to make her miserable at the end, and of course it, it, it ruined the picture. What about Walter Matthau and One Foot on the Floor? Oh, I used it that in, in um, house calls, like house calls. It paid off for me after all the years when Matthau uh, uh, was in bed with Brenda Jackson, talks about the old century. Uh, even a married couple could be in bed together only if one had one foot on the floor. And he said, let's see if it's possible with one foot on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and they went through this without a word of dialogue. They went through trying to screw with one foot on the floor. And Penelope Gilead said it was the greatest instant of slapstick she ever saw in the movie. <laughs> Do you think pictures have improved because there's so much more freedom? I think they're much more realistic. Much more realistic. 
as the years went on and censorship became a thing of the past, it actually became much easier to write the scripts. We had more freedom. I, I think the freedom is being abused today. There's, there, there should be limits on it. I think uh, some pictures have the four letter words are in every sentence, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, there's a freedom today, and I, 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 we find, I found it much easier to write at the, towards the end of my career than I did at the beginning of the career. And, and, and uh, I was, uh, my last academy nomination, I was 75 years old at the time of the nomination. And uh, I, I still find it easier to write than I did in the old days because not only were you shackled by limitations on the dialogue, you were shackled by situations that you could use. For instance, you couldn't have divorce. You couldn't have affairs. You don't think of that sort. God uh, forbid anything of homosexual, anything like that in the picture. And you were fired from the lot. It, it, it's, it's, uh, I think it's much easier today. What about the role of the screenwriter today? I think uh, I think Bruno Chabot wrote that in the uh, in the program for the uh, tribute to Philip Dunk, and he quoted Irving Thalberg saying, "Oh, more than sixty years ago, uh, I see if I remember the, the gist of it. He said uh, the writer is the most important part of the making of a motion picture." And we must do everything in our power to prevent them from finding out. Julie, you can get tired. You can suffer. No, I'm not tired. No, I'm, not I'm tired. already okay. approaching the five. What's the matter? Yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> I'll, show you the, I'll show you the ravages of age. What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're quoting the Thalberg line. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 writers yeah. are the most important part. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that attitude exists just as strongly today, if not even stronger, because the, this new idiotic thing of the round table writing, it's, it's a, because it works in a comedy, in a sitcom, where there's no sense or logic in anything that's said, and the producer's saying, why don't we use that round table method for dramas if it works for comedy? Why went away for dramas? Well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. And it shows their attitude towards the right, towards writing. Even in those days, uh, there was a lot of rewriting done uh, if they were not satisfied with the script, but nothing that approaches the round table approach of today. Uh, uh, the Yankee Doodle, Danny was written, and uh, I don't think it was a bad, too bad a script, but Cagney was very dissatisfied with, and insisted my brother and I work on the script, which we did. And uh, we didn't take the credit on it. Uh, and to our great embarrassment, and people didn't like it, they took a full-page ad in the uh, trade papers, the Cagney brothers, thanking us for the, for the contribution. How have uh, conditions improved for screenwriters over the years, if they have? The first thing that comes to mind, and the only thing that comes to mind, is that the writers are much more highly paid today. Uh, Three million dollars for a script, a million dollars, six hundred thousand dollars, unheard of in the old days. And, and the thing that abuses me, they'll pay a million dollars for a script and then put another writer on to, <laughs> to read But you know, I, I, things occurred to me that even in those, the beginning days, my first week in Hollywood, I was, I was ghostwriting. I pick up the Hollywood Reporter, and there's an item. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the novelist. Stock Young. Paramount executives are throwing their hats in the air over the script handed in by Stock Young based on his novel, So Red the Rose. Never in the history of motion pictures has there been a script so beautifully constructed with such wonderful characters, great dialogue. Paramount is absolutely right. End of paragraph, new paragraph. Patterson McNutt has been signed to do a Polish job. <laughs> 
And I, and I knew immediately in my first week in Hollywood what the situation was, what to expect. And I was not disappointed in my expectations. Throughout the ages, the big beat of the writer has been the lack of a control over the work they have done. I don't see that changing unless the method of payment is the same as it is in the stage. In the drama skill contract, you cannot change a line without the permission of the writer. Change anything without the... That is because the writer is gambling along with the producer. As long as you are a writer for hire, uh, I, I think the fight is quite hopeless. I think that despite everything, pictures are better today than they've ever been. The majority have ever been. They're more mature, they're... Uh, in the old days, boy meets girl, boy breaks up, boy gets girl again. And uh, every picture ended with a clinch. Uh, where they were hampered by censorship. And today, I think the thing that's improved pictures is the, uh, is the lack of censorship. Now, I'm afraid that censorship may come back because of the abuse of the liberty that we have been given, which would be a terrible thing. I think the guilds will fight that like mad. I think, I hope the producers will too. I think maybe the First Amendment will save us. I'm often asked by young aspiring writers, how do I break in to the business today? Uh, well, one thing, the best way, of course, is to write a script and which thousands of people are doing. And uh, if your script sold, then you, you, you have your entree into the business. Uh, the second way is film schools. Producers are actively like baseball scout, scouting minor leagues. The so producers are in a fashion scouting to film schools and asking for promising students or promising scripts, which didn't exist in the old days. There were no film schools in the old days. When sound came in, there was hysteria. They wanted people with experience. The greatest asset you ha would have would be a head of gray hair. You had experience, you've written dialogue, you know. Whereas a young person didn't know, they was unknown quality. They couldn't trust, they had, after a while, something they called the junior writer. And they paid them 50 or 70 dollars a week to see if they would develop. But the big money was paid by writers with gray hairs. I have lectured at many film classes all over the country. I'm practically always asked the question, how do you write good dialogue? My answer is, it cannot be taught. You, it's either you have it in you, somehow or other. Uh, I think you can learn a lot in the film class. You can learn structure, you can learn character, you can learn development, you can learn things, but you cannot learn, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I can be refuted on this, but I don't think you can teach how to write dialogue. Oh, good dialogue. Some people have an ear, and some people haven't got an ear for dialogue. And uh, I will confess that in, um, I don't know, 50-some pictures, most of my characters speak alike. <laughs> There's always one character that's, that's me in the picture. I think most the writers, most writers write themselves into the pictures because they're most, most familiar with themselves. Good dialogue is something the audience thinks is spoken and speech is something that is written. Dialogue is to be heard, speech is to be on the printed page. Who are you really and what were you before? What did you do and what did you think, huh? We said no questions. Is looking at you, kid. Uh, I think the process of writing dialogue is that characters write your dialogue for you. If you get the right character, 
and, and you can write, and, and you're able to write the dialogue that fits the character, then you have good dialogue. If you have a character that is foreign to you, strange to you, you really don't know him or you haven't met him, then it's tough to write the dialogue to make it sound like the character's dialogue. But if you, if you talk in a certain way you, yourself, you give that talk. I, uh, I think every, if you have a picture, every one character is Philip or George Epstein. <laughs> and I think one character is always Billy Wilder, and one character is Mel Chamberson <laughs> in the picture. And you write what you would say in that, in that situation, that scene, especially if you're writing comedy and if you're fairly funny in that. Well, that's something I want to know about. What's the basic difference between writing comedy and writing drama? It's much, much tougher to write comedy than it is to write drama. Much, much tougher. Why? Well, you never, I, I, I'm never confident as what the reception is going to be to a line I have written. I've gone to the previews, you know, in fear and trepidation listening. Sometimes you prove it right and sometimes you, you think you have a good light and nothing happens. And uh, it's, uh, but you just gotta keep writing the line the way you can read it. I, I, uh, I would never dream of doing uh, Jurassic Park. You know, I, the, the animals had better dialogue than the actors. I thought I would uh, uh, I would dream of doing a picture with all poor people <laughs> uh, with, with, with gangster talk, things like that. I just can't do gangster talk, but if I picture where people are mature and adult, fairly intelligent here and there, I think I can write that dialogue. But Julie, you're saying that the essentials of writing dialogue cannot be taught. You're either a storyteller or you're not a storyteller. If you're not a storyteller, nothing is going to help. If you are a storyteller, a lot of things can help. The film schools can help you if you're a storyteller. If you're not, first of all, they never should have been admitted to the class in the first place. Long, long time ago, I stopped writing camera angles because the director pays no attention to the camera, no attention at all. Which is, when you write, you visualize. I have never seen a first cut of a picture I've written. But I thought the picture was any good. I was in despair of anything. Because as you write a scene, you imagine two characters here, then the director shooting the two characters are there. You know, oh my God, he killed the whole scene. <laughs> but the audience doesn't know that. So, uh... I'm, I'm famous for hating first cuts or rough cuts and everything. Any of them are any good. As a matter of fact, my brother and I wrote a note to Hal Wallace at the first cut of Casablanca telling how terrible we thought it was. He took the note and put it in the drawer. Thereafter, any time he had an argument about anything, he would open the door, pull out, our note, pull out that note, and hand it to us <laughs> to, to, to read. <laughs> I, have, I have often been asked, how did the finish come about in Casablanca? Well, you have never witnessed such consternation in a studio when we were about three quarters through with the picture, we ran out of story. We could not use the rest of the story of the play because in the play, not only does Bogart not shoot Major Strasser, but Major Strasser arrests Bogart and takes him off to jail as the curtain comes down, which was very unsatisfactory. It was, and uh, I think there were 75 writers on the contract and Warner's had 75 writers trying to think of an ending or something that could happen. He was stopping people on the street and asking if they had any ideas. And my brother and I were driving through the studio and don't forget we were twins. And just below Beverly Glen Boulevard, east of Beverly Glen Boulevard, we turned to each other and said, round up the usual suspects. 
and in the half hour that it took to drive from Beverly Glen to the studio, we had the ending all blocked out. So before we got through, got to the studio, the ending was there, it was written maybe two afternoons, and we had an ending to the picture. I think perhaps you're right. Now there's a lot of stories which I think are all true, but that uh, there were two endings written and shot, absolutely untrue. Not true at all. That was the ending, it was always was the ending. The way we wrote the scene, yes, my brother and I, was that the Bogart character did not say this is the uh, beginning, but it was given to uh, Claude Rains said to him, we think this is a beautiful film. And Bogart said to him, our last line was, yes, but don't forget, you still owe me 10,000 francs. Now, we'll never know whether that's better than, but I'm very satisfied and happy with the ending as it is. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Casablanca was the beginning of a beautiful friendship with moviegoers all over the world. That classic screenplay Julie wrote with his twin brother Phil and Howard W. Koch. It was followed by a lifetime of others, full of wit and bite and life. And in all of his work, like the song says, it's still the same old story. A fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. Thank you, Julie, for reminding us.